words. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for our ninth edition in the Virtual Throws Conference. Um, we're really excited to talk with Coach David Sweeney of Athletics Ireland today. Um, Coach Sweeney is, is the field event coordinator for Athletics Ireland and is formerly the throws coordinator and uh, is now coordinating all the field events. He's going to present to us on um, throwing in Ireland, um, some Paralympic throwing experience, and some lessons he's learned along the way. I'm really excited. Um, before we get going, turn it over to him. Big thanks to MF Athletic and National Throws Coach Association. Um, just a reminder that if you help us get the word out on these each week via Twitter, um, MF is donating a $50 gift card to one lucky fan each week that we do this um, to try, try and help us get the word out. So stay tuned at the end. We will announce that person. Um, and if you're looking to, to figure out where to access these, uh, Virtual Throws Conference on YouTube, but also follow the National Throws Coach Association on Twitter. And that's where we're posting a lot of the info. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Coach. And um, he's going to do a quick intro of himself, and we'll get rolling on his presentation. So thanks for joining us, Coach Sweeney, and uh, uh, we're excited to hear what you have to say. Cheers, Brandon. Um, I guess the first thing, you know, I'd, li I'd like to thank uh, Rob and yourself for uh, asking me to come on here today. Um, I mean, I've been watching your shows, and I mean, you've had some legends on there. And so to be honest, uh, I'm pretty bowled over to be even asked. So, but it's, um, it's really nice for me to be able to uh, give some perspective um, about things in Ireland. And uh, I mean, my first thoughts when you asked me was, um, what the hell am I going to talk about? You know, so, um, but I thought maybe I could talk a little bit about uh, Irish throwing history. Um, we've quite a bit of... Uh, Quite a few legends and that go back through the years uh, so i'll bring you through a few of those and some of the stories and uh, i'll talk a little bit about uh, paralympic um, coaching uh, i was lucky enough to be involved with uh, paralympics ireland for a few years and, um, and there were some great athletes and some great people that came across there and, uh, and I think lots of lots of lessons for all athletics coaches and they can learn, you know, from from para sport. And um, and then uh, I think I'd maybe just uh, give you some maybe lessons that I've learned uh, over the years. Uh, I don't think they're unique to me, um, but uh, but maybe some things that I've kind of come across that maybe other coaches might be interested in. And uh, so, um, so that's that's kind of where where I see it going. Um, um, and I think I'll have to share my screen there. Do I? Yeah. So there should be a yeah green button down in the middle. I can get you going. Yeah. And guys, uh, I just feel like uh, uh, interrupt me at any stage if you have any questions or you want me to clarify anything. So host disabled participant screen oh, sharing. Oh, sorry, 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 I can fix that. My apologies. Yeah, it's still saying disabled there. Well, should be good now. There we go. Awesome. Yeah, we got you. Sorry about that. No worries, no worries. So. <coughs> Okay, so um, I, uh, I kind of gave you a few ideas there about what I was going to talk about. Um, so I guess I'll get, get straight into it. Um, and I, I guess the first thing really was to give a little bit of perspective on Ireland and athletics. Um, and, uh, you know, Ireland, is, it's, we're only a small country. You know, we're the same size. I looked up the area. We're about the same size as South Carolina and the same population as Washington State. So uh, so we're not that significant in numbers, but uh, but I think when you come to uh, look at what we've probably done in the throwing area in the past, um, we've made a really big impact. 
Um, currently, we uh, Athletics Ireland is the governing body here, and we have sixty thousand members. Um, that would in, you know range from juniors, juveniles, right from kids right through to masters athletes and full runners and stuff here. Um, but it's uh, that's been expanding. So the you know the participation in athletics has been growing significantly in Ireland, and. I noticed during this COVID uh, breakdown or COVID-19 um, uh, episode, uh, the number of people out in the streets is just incredible. So, uh, so I hope they all, they all become athletes down the road. Um, uh, we've th- three, um, three kind of areas where we have competitions in athletics at the moment. Uh, the, our schools athletics, uh, our athletics clubs, and then the university programs, they, universities have an indoor and an outdoor uh, competition season so so kind of three platforms that we uh, that we have during the year for our track and field and we um, and uh, I think one of the probably the, one of the biggest things we have at the moment we, we've huge competition from other sports um, you know and especially our, especially our throwers I think a lot of our throwers are being uh, the uh, aggressively recruited by rugby and from rowing and from Gaelic football, from uh, hurling. Um, so uh, so it's tough to actually to hold on to talent, it's tough to get talent in the first place, uh, but actually holding on to it is, uh, is pretty hard as well. And uh, so, you know, I think we, we've got to look at ways of being um, more creative and uh, making it attractive for people to stay in the sport. You know, so. Um, I'll come, maybe come back to some of those things later. Um, uh, the tradition in, in Ireland, as I said, it's a, it's, it's huge. Um, we've won twenty three Olympic medals in throwing, and uh, you'd be glad to know that f- fifteen of them were for USA. So you owe <laughs> us, guys. <laughs> um, and I think that. No, but honestly, uh, there was uh, there was most most of these guys were back in. I think the first medals were won in eighteen ninety six. Uh, actually, the very first uh, ever Olympic medal awarded in Athens in eighteen ninety six was to an Irish American. He was competing for US in the in the long jump, actually. Um, but the very first Olympic medal ever awarded. Um, but uh, most of our uh, most of our athletes. Uh, uh, they up until I think 1928. Uh, that was the first one that actually wore an Irish vest to win a medal, and that was Pat O'Callaghan, um, or Pat O'Callaghan and Bob Tisdall. Um, they were around the same time, but um, um, but uh, the, 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 the real story of why they all competed for the USA it's it kind of is a bit of a history lesson. Um, and it goes back to the story of immigration. Uh, we had the potato famine here in the 1870s, around 1840s, 50s, 60s, 70s, around those, around those years. A huge amount of people went to the States, and it was the thing to do. And uh, But there was nothing here. You know, there was, there was no work. There was no uh, jobs. And, you know, so it, people, uh, they either went to the UK or they went to the States. And, and when they went there, they had trouble assimilating into the into the states, and uh, you know it, it, it was difficulty. So they they tended to club together, and uh, and they brought their traditions from home with them, and uh, not you know their own national identities. So, and part of that tradition was throwing, you know. and uh, and part of their tradition as well was maybe a kind of antipathy towards uh, towards Britain at the time. It's, they, Britain was probably felt as to be a, a cause of why many of the Irish uh, had, had to leave in the first place. So, um, so many of the uh, many of them uh, they they joined the Irish American Athletic Club, and uh, their big rivals were the New York Athletic Club, and uh, and then many of these throwers they were big men, so they were snapped up by the NYPD. Um, so uh, they so there's a a lot of links kind of go in there. They became known as the Irish Wales, and um, and I'll talk about uh, some of these guys now. Um, but you can see the, uh, the medal table below. It's uh, it's a phenomenal uh, 
kind of medals for for a place so small here. And I only wish we had them again, you know. So, <laughs> um, just when I was uh, over, we we we've, we actually have a uh, throws uh, of athletes and coaches that were involved in the in the seventies, eighties, and nineties, and we were we keep in touch with each other a lot. Uh, so, and we're, we're regularly kind of posting stories about old throwers. But so a lot of these photographs came out of these uh, conversations. Um, these statues are all around the country, um, uh, and they're all of our previous Olympic champions. Uh, and to be honest, when you, when I know I was uh, at this statue with Matt McGrath on the left hand side, and the, the one with John Flanagan there, and it, it really would put. Uh, shivers down your neck you know you kind of think my god there's an athlete and a statue to them you, you just don't see them very often you know so it's 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 a great feeling that that uh, something gives you a lot of pride in your in your sport you know um talking about a few of these guys um i'll kind of go through one or two stories uh, matt mcgrath there on the uh, top left he uh matt won a gold and two silvers and uh and I think his last medal, the, his hammer medals, uh, they were 12 years, they were one 12 years apart, but he won his last medal at the age of age of 47. Uh, so it's a phenomenal uh, achievement. I think he must be the oldest throws medalist ever. You know? um, but he was, he was involved actually in a bit of a flag incident back in the, the Olympics were held in London, I think it was 1908, and uh, they were walking in, be, walking in behind the American flag, and Ralph Rose was the American flag bearer, and apparently, they, I, I don't know, you never let truth get in the way of a good story, so I'm not sure how, <laughs> truth, how true this is, but, uh, uh, but Matt McGrath is allegedly supposed to have uh, warned Ralph Rose uh, as you were walking into the stadium, everybody had to lower the flag when they passed the King of England. Oh, and he was told in no uncertain terms that if he lowered the flag, he was going to be hospitalized. And uh, so the flag wasn't lowered. And I think there was a major international incident. Uh, you know, how dare, nobody has ever insulted the King like this. Um, <laughs> so I think he had some answering to do after it, anyway. Um so that was a, that was a good one. Um, moving, moving across, uh, or moving down, sorry, Martin Sheridan in the, um, in the bottom here. Martin is probably, possibly the greatest Olympic athlete ever. Uh, greatest, one of the greatest throwers ever, anyway. He won five gold medals, two silver and two bronze. And uh, and it was in a range of events. It was in the discus. The discus was probably his main event, but he also won the Greek discus, the shot foot, the fourteen pound stone. Which, you know, some of these events obviously aren't going anymore. And then he won also won medals in the standing long jump and the standing high jump. So, the, uh, so it was interesting some of the events that were going back then. Um. And there were stories about him when he, he came back to Ireland. He, um, he he even gave demonstrations in pole vaults. So uh, so he was. Uh, he, I think the people of Bohola and County Mayo they they hold him in incredible esteem. You know, uh, he died actually. Unfortunately, he died at the age of about thirty seven. I think it was the day before his thirty seventh birthday. And uh, he uh, interestingly in. You know, in, in these difficult times with COVID, he, he died from the Spanish flu, uh, sort of the pandemic that was uh, in existence then. So, um, Pat O'Callaghan uh, is uh, a bit of a legend as well. I remember seeing Pat when, when competing at national championships when we were younger. Uh, Pat used to attend all the time and uh, he was... Uh, you know, everybody looked up to him. He's still a fine, big, strong man. You know, a big, tall man. But um, but he um, Pat won the hammer in nineteen twenty eight and nineteen thirty two, and um, he he uh, I think he was also favourite for the nineteen thirty six Olympics. But then Ireland didn't get to send a team. Um, but uh, an interesting story on the thirty two Olympics in. 
I think it was in St. Louis in the States. He, he went along with uh, three pairs of throwing shoes. So he thought he was really prepared. And, uh, and in those days, you threw off grass or uh, kind of a clay surface. And uh, so he had three different, three different lengths of spikes on three different shoes. And uh, he was going to uh, you know, be prepared for whatever was thrown at him. But it turned out there was a really impenetrable uh, cinder type surface on the, on the circle. So for his first three throws, he couldn't turn properly at all. And he managed to scrape into the, uh, into the to, get, to get another three throws. But in between uh, the, the last, the third throw and the fourth throw, he grabbed one of his teammates, Bob Tisdall, and uh, they found a nail or a, a file and a hacksaw, and they, they got the spikes off. And eventually, by the uh, apparently by the sixth round, he they just got all this all the spikes off and uh, he got his winning his his final throw clinched the uh, clinched the championship so so I think the lesson there kind of be prepared um because you never know what's going to hit you you know um so yeah so there's um there's there, there's some great characters Pat McDonald was uh, he was a huge guy he won the shot put he was six foot five and three hundred pounds he uh, apparently was nicknamed Babe. You know, by his, by his uh, training mates, and uh, and then this book here on the right, uh, this is um, this came out last year or two years ago now, twenty eighteen, uh, but it's it's a whole history of Martin Sheridan and all his uh, exploits, and it goes through all the every single competition that he competed in the states, the the crowd that were at it, who was organising it, what his results were. It's it's a fascinating book actually, and it just uh, Margaret Malloy, she's um, a librarian, or worked in the library in, uh, in near, near Martin's hometown in Bahola, and she produced it, and it's a, it's a real fantastic uh, production, you know. So, so that's a bit of history. Um, I suppose that's to, to move on from that. Uh, kind of question is, well, where are we now? And um, and I thought we'd look at the Irish throws records as they currently stand. And um, you can see there. So some some of these records are pretty respectable, you know, um, but they've stood for a long time. And uh, I think uh, I think five or six of these I would they would have been around my time, I suppose, that I would have kind of grown up with them. And uh, so it was great to you know they they were kind of they were role models for. Um, for me and for many other people that were around at the same time. And um, I think the trick now, I suppose, is we, we, we need to uh, produce new role models for the, the younger generation. Um, uh, so, um, yeah. So, um, I suppose one, one of the questions I kind of asked is, you know, how have we developed? Um, kind of asked myself. And, uh, you know, tradition, the tradition of throwing was a huge factor. And, uh, and you know, there were, there, gradually over the years, you know, competition came in from other sports, and that brought challenge and change and stuff. You know, uh, but you know, nowadays, uh, you know, we we definitely have to transition. You know, I, th I think we would have been uh, very much an amateur sport organized by amateurs, by volunteers, and you know, athletics obviously has become such a professional sport now and uh, and that's something that we're transitioning from as well and that we're we're gradually setting up really you know, trying try to set up professional structures and support services around athletes um one of the biggest things that has helped us uh, over the years has been the nc2a uh, college system you know it's been i think it's been absolutely instrumental and uh, if you go back to uh, our record holders here five of those eight throws record holders went through the NC2A system. So, uh, so yeah, it's, 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 it's been crucial in developing us as a country and keeping our throws levels going. Um, uh, I think, you know, if, if you look at what I, what I wanted to do is maybe, you know, look at the NC2A system and how that has helped us, you know, what have been the benefits for us and maybe the challenges or, uh, from an Irish perspective. 
it's probably be different if you're a college coach and what your perspective might be. Um, but from an Irish perspective, it's been fantastic to uh, for our kids to aim towards, you know, trying to get a scholarship in a college there, you know, and the education that it's going to provide. And I mean, there's no way you can match the the training or the competition environments that uh, that, are, that you're going to get in the, the college system there. But also, you know, I think you really see that when uh, a lot of our kids go off to college and they come back, they have grown so much, you know, not just athletically, but, you know, personally as well, you know, from the new life experience and the, the new cultures that they're meeting. And uh, so I think that's a huge factor. And, um, and then obviously, obviously the performance that's come back as well, you know, the increased performance levels. Um, but along with that, then there's, there's, there's challenges and, um, uh, you know, some may can may, may consider that when you go into the college system, there's a lack of time to develop, and that you're you're hit with competitions straight away, and uh, the competition season's very long. The winter season runs into the summer season, and maybe there's a question mark on the, is the athlete actually getting time to develop? Um, and definitely, there is a clash with uh, our own Team Ireland opportunities. Um, Sometimes, you know, athletes are not available due to college commitments or they eventually, you know, when they do come back, they're tired because the competitive season has been so intensive, you know. Um, so I suppose you, you could consider that there's there are compromises have to be made to your long-term career. <laughs> and, um, but I think if you balance it out, um, I mean, if I was an athlete or I was advising somebody now, you know, I'd, I'd be still looking very seriously at going to the states, and uh, there are there are options available now in Ireland that were never there before. Um, we uh, the universities here have uh, been developing a, a lot, and uh, they're putting increasing um, increasing focus into track and field. Um, there's two, maybe three or four universities now uh, that they're really um, building little hubs and. Uh, and then we also were getting uh, quite a bit of support from Sport Sport Ireland for our higher level athletes. You know. So, um, um, so uh, you know, just the challenges really coming um, at the moment, I suppose, for our sport here. Um, I think the first thing is it's it's going to be tricky getting back on our feet after this COVID nineteen. You know, it, we don't. Uh, I think as a nation and. I'm sure you're the same in the States that we're, we're kind of feeling our way and uh, we have a roadmap and it's been very well set out, but we don't know how successful that roadmap is going to be. Um, so apart from that, then we're, we, we have a big challenge in resourcing the sport. Um, it's it's uh, competitive trying to get sponsors into, into a sport like track and field. And uh, we've been lucky enough to have some very good sponsors uh, and um, you know that's something that we would really try to work hard. But, uh, but and, and they're absolutely crucial. And those members, all that membership number that we have, they are crucial to the development of the sport. And um, one of the big issues I see is that we uh, we have a probably a lack of uh, in numbers of full time coaches. We very few full time coaches, and we have a lack of coaches in general. And uh, so that's something that um, we, we as an organization are trying to address. And, uh, we're building a kind of a mentoring program. Uh, we're, we're bringing in uh, some expertise externally and, um, and matching them up with a number of coaches and trying to build the knowledge and uh, try and grow it a little bit, you know. Um, facilities is a, is a difficulty here. You know, our weather is, it's kind of freakishly good here at the moment, but uh for the last two months, it's just been outstanding. Uh, but it's not normally like that. Uh, it can be cold and wet and windy. And, you know, for building technical events, it's it's difficult uh, to do that in that environment. Um, I know when we travel to uh, Sweden or uh, Iceland or uh, Estonia, other countries that have maybe similar type weather, even worse than us, 
but they have incredible indoor facilities. And uh, that's something that costs a lot of money. And uh, we we tend to rely on other institutions to kind of help us with that, you know. Um, so keeping people in the sport is a problem. Um, as I was saying earlier, we lose, lose people to other sports and there's a, a huge drop off, you know, at age 17, 16, 17, 18, it just starts to slide. And, you know, that's for, that's for a number of reasons, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's, and we're not unique. It's not just our sport. Uh, you know, it's exam pressure. It's maybe peer pressure, people discovering social lives. It's, uh, they're kind of figuring out athletics is too tough for them and, um, and they don't want to put in the effort and it's uh, athletics is not an easy sport. So, and then the last point there was just really that, you know, we need to develop role models for the, for the current generation. So, um, so I think we're going to move on now to the, the Paralympic, um, my, my Paralympic experience, um, and feel to put in any time if you want. Um, so, I mean, Paralympic sport, it's just becoming more and uh, more competitive. So, you know, you can see every time, I know for the last number of years, I was at World and uh, Paralympic Games and European Championships, and you could see the professionalism around each of the country setups where it's just getting better and better and you can see the coaching expertise that was being brought in was getting better and there's huge investment and uh, and you know us as an NGB in Ireland like Paralympics were the NGB um, for Ireland but uh, all NGBs are measured in medals and they're supported depending on how well you know they, they're you know their sponsors will back them depending on how many medals they're getting and uh, governments will support them depending on how many medals they're getting. And so at the end of the day, you know, you, sometimes you, you, you want to have this idea about taking your time to grow the sport, but you need to deliver as well. And you can really see that countries like China, Brazil, Russia, Ukraine, they're, they're just investing hugely. And um, gladly, or luckily, we, we were extremely successful over the last 10 or so years, um, I think we were the second, as far as I remember, we were the second best in Rio Olympics, Paralympics, we were the second best worldwide on medal count per population. Um, wow. And that was all because we had good support systems in place and, uh, and the government uh, through Sport Ireland were investing heavily in our key athletes. You know. um, and we were we're really trying to put a, a really good team around each of these athletes in terms of you know physio and uh, S and C and nutrition and uh, physiology and you know the whole the whole package psychology and um, and it was and those teams worked really really well together you know so um, <clears throat> Paralympic coaching was something uh, I think I first got involved in 2012 and uh, to be honest I didn't know an awful lot about uh, Paralympic sport at the time and uh, I think for a lot of people it, it will be <clears throat> you know you consider it's an, it's an unknown territory <clears throat> but you don't necessarily need to know <clears throat> you need to learn but you don't need to know before you start <clears throat> and like, there's, huge, there's huge amounts of learning required Excuse me. Um, you know, I think you, you've got to learn a lot about the disabilities of the um, <clears throat> of the athletes involved, and uh, and also what capabilities they have. And, um, and I think preconceptions that you might have about how to coach discus or how to coach shot put have to, you know, I think you can store that knowledge. But you can't apply it in a one case fits all. You know, you, it's not like a copy and paste. This will work with one athlete, and it'll also work with another athlete. <clears throat> because the abilities and disabilities of these athletes are totally different. You know? And uh, you know, if if you're trying to uh, normally work with a really dominant right side, trying to get your hip in at the finish, and then that 
muscle structure isn't available to you uh, through the disability of the athlete. That's it's, it's a, you, you have to take that on board. So so it's really it's really in a very interesting um, scenario where you have to learn so much about the athlete, and the athlete has to trust you, I suppose, to uh, give you as much information as possible to enable you to coach. You know, but um, but I think you know with the with the limitations, uh, you know, you, and the new solutions, you really have to be, uh, you know, thinking outside your box. You know, um, so if if you've got very much one dimensional kind of thinking, you're probably not gonna not gonna enjoy it. You know, it's going to be difficult for you. <clears throat> but it's it's hugely hugely inspirational. I have to say, you know, of our sport. Uh, you know, I think the athletes that you come across, uh, many of them have had. You know, they, they, they have been uh, would have come, had uh, obtained their disabilities through different ways. Some through accidents, some through other reasons. But uh, you know, they've had bumpy roads, and and uh, you know, they've gone through a lot to get where they where they are now. And uh, you know, there's so much to be admired. I think. Um, so I think it's 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 something that I would really recommend. You know, I I find that when you go move from the para sport back to the coaching able-bodied sport you, you 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 approach it with a totally different view again you know and you you look at the individual and uh, you really look at the strengths and weaknesses of the individual uh, so i think it's it's something i'd recommend for everyone to get involved in para sport you know? um hey, hey dave is that, that is that because uh I mean, there's so many different levels and types of disabilities. Mm -hmm. So you have to be obviously well-versed in so many different levels or areas of coaching. Is that, yeah. is that what makes going from para back to able body uh, so much more beneficial? Yeah, well, I, I think it's because you, your preconceptions of a standardized technique go out the window and I think you, you you now look at the individual much more and look at what that individual is capable of um, because you know with you know if you deal with an athlete with maybe cerebral palsy or a wheelchair athlete they're they're, they're totally different uh, problems you come across and you've got to find new solutions for each one of these problems and um, you know, different way of doing your strength training, different way uh, of dealing with nutrition even, you know. Um, and uh, so I think it, it gets you to think about your what you're doing an awful lot more. And I, I think when you bring that type of uh, thinking back to able-bodied sport, it, I think you, move, you should move up a level, you know, in, in your thinking and be able to deliver much better solutions for your athletes. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Do you, uh, the, la the last point, I, I kind of, uh, you know, you expect to make lots of mistakes. And uh, I uh, I made loads. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll be reminded of them by plenty of <laughs> athletes I came across. But um, I remember the, the very first, uh, my first involvement, I was invited along to a uh, training camp in Grand Canaria, and uh, I was working with uh, <clears throat> one of our blind athletes, um, Eilish. Um, she she probably remembers this. Uh, that we were doing some medicine ball uh, kind of warm up exercises, and uh, so we we we'd set up a little uh, kind of triangle, and um, Eilish would throw the ball kind of chest pass to me. I'd catch it. Eilish, is, Eilish had a personal assistant. I'd lob the ball back to the assistant and the assistant would hand it to Eilish and the triangle kind of worked around. And this was all going great until her uh, her assistant went off to take a phone call and uh, <laughs> I saw Eilish there kind of waiting for the ball so I just threw it at her. And uh, so the first thing I discovered is that she actually was blind for sure. Um, because it nearly knocked her head off, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I was—I was never—I um, 
I was never let forget that one anyway. So, um, but, uh, so I'm sorry, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> but there's uh, there's loads of other things, and it's um, but yeah, it's a, it's it's a good old uh, it's a good good area to be involved in. Coach, and, uh, have you had? And it's very other? it's very professional, you know. It's, the, uh, the level of professionalism at international level, it's, um, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty stunning what some athletes are achieving. Yeah. Coach, have you had any like, you, aha moments coaching para-athletes that you've been able like, that have connect, connected specific dots for you with, you know, bringing back to some of your able-bodied athletes or any examples of that? Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm not sure about connecting dots, you know, but, <clears throat> but I, I, you know, I, I realized that I, I was going to, actually, what I'm going to do is going to show you a couple of examples of uh, throwers that I came across and maybe some of the technical issues that we kind of had to address. Right. And, um, but I think, that, you know, the biggest thing for me was, I suppose I arrived and I thought, okay, well, I've, I think I have an idea of how discus works and how shop it works. Um, but it wasn't working. You know, it's, you know, I, so I, I, I just realized I had to change my thinking and, uh, and <clears throat> yeah. And it's, and, it, and it, I think it, it also, I, th I think what it created for me as well was, um, it made you were able to see a lot more when you came back to looking at uh, able body throwers because you were so um, you were you were being exposed to kind of new uh, new problems and uh, instead of just you know expecting the same thing day in day out or whatever you know so you know I don't know if that's sort of my, my take on it you know but, um, so, um, what I wanted to show here was uh, this was uh, one of one of the athletes that uh, <clears throat> that I worked with, um, Noel Lenehan. And uh, so Noel worked; um, she's a discus thrower, clearly, and uh, but she had cerebral cerebral palsy, and the the CP affected the left hand side of her body, and um, so. If you kind of work with uh, standard thinking on discus throwing, I suppose, is that you would, when you turn at the back of the circle, you, you put a lot of pressure on your left leg and, uh, and you use that left leg to create speed across the circle from that push off the back of the circle. And that just wasn't possible with Noel um, because she wouldn't have the balance so she reduced balance on her left side and probably a little bit weaker on her left side. <clears throat> so if you try to do a normal technique, it's it's really just going to go all over the place. Um, so we kind of played around with a few different things. I think we started off by uh, doing South African throat turns, where she could kind of get a little bit more um, <clears throat> linear without having to turn around the left leg as much. And then as she became a little bit more um, conditioned and get a lot stronger and faster. She was running out of circle in the with the South Africans. So so what we did, this was her new start position where we pulled the left leg back, maybe 50 centimeters off the back of the circle. And um, instead of leaving the discus behind you, we try to throw the discus ahead of her. And uh, by throwing the discus ahead, you reduce the kind of time under tension on the uh, on the legs at the back of the circle. And so you basically throw it towards the right sector line and uh, <clears throat> you let the feet, th th this makes it much easier to get across the circle. Feet come in kind of quickly into place and, uh, and then you throw again. So, so it's very right side. So you kind of think right, right, you know, throw the right side at the back, throw the right side at the, at the finish. And uh, this is something that worked for Noel, and um, uh, she ended up um, breaking a world record for her category. Um, so we play that actually. Just it's uh, um, so you might get an idea. 
Press your left, please, for you, okay? It's a little glitchy, but we can get the idea, I think. Yeah, that was better that time. Oh. So, Coach, how did how did you come up with that? Just trial and error? Or? Well, it was um, it was actually a, a, a coach from Ukraine that I came across years ago. <clears throat> I think it was about twenty five years ago or twenty years ago. He came to Ireland, and he was coaching one of our hammer throwers, Paddy McGrath, and a discus thrower, John Menton. And uh, this was the way he taught discus. Uh, that you uh, you kind of loaded to your left side at the back of the circle. Um, there was no kind of shift in the weight over and back. You would, everything was loaded on your left side, and you threw the discus ahead and um, get the feet in quickly and throw again. And um, it's actually, if you look at um, Lucas or Lucas Vice Heidegger at the moment, he's a little bit similar to that in that he throws it, the discus into a very high uh, orbit and then catches it again to, to, to deliver into the finish. Um, so uh, so that, that, that was, I guess, where I got the idea. And uh, I said, look, let's try this. It's, some, it's something different, but we'll see if it works. But she, uh, Noelle, um, found it really comfortable for her. And uh, it allowed her to move a little bit more freely across the circle. Um, now there were there were other problems. I mean, if you, if you go through or throw, you know, the, the orbit of the discus isn't quite right, and, uh, and that's something that we tried to work on quite a lot, but we we just didn't achieve it yet. Anyway, um, um, it's probably something that can be can be improved, you know. So, um, so I'll go on to another. <coughs> Thrower here. Um, this is uh, Neve McCarthy. Neve was a F41 discus thrower, so that they're that's basically athletes of smaller stature. Um, and Neve came into our program uh, through a kind of a talent identification day, and um, she, I think, somebody recommended she come along to this thing, and and she had no background in sport whatsoever. And uh, but she just thought this. I think somebody recommended she try this out, and uh, so uh, the program manager James uh, Nolan at the time, uh, James Nolan, identified her as well. You know, this girl has ability. You know, and um, we weren't we weren't sure quite what for, um, whether it was going to be as a sprinter or as a thrower or whatever, or, um, but. We uh, we tried her out with some discus throwing. So I think I I met her. I'll show you this was the first training session that we did, <clears throat> and I just kind of brought her through some drills and um, to kind of see what sort of um, if she had the ability to turn, if she had kind of had a feeling for movement and. Um, so these were all on the first day, and um, and you know I kind of thought there she did a kind of like a skip, skip and turn, and she moved pretty well. This was her first competition; it uh, she wasn't turning yet, but it wasn't um, she didn't break any records at this stage. I think that was sixteen meters or something like that. <laughs> um, but she uh, she's probably mortified looking at this if she sees it. Um, but over time, then um, what we what we had to do, we 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 kind of put together a plan because she had no sporting background. We uh, we really said we'd do this development slowly and really work on her coordination and her flexibility and just general movement skills, and not really overload her with too much throwing and or overload her in the gym. And uh, it's all about movement skills initially. And uh, the strength and conditioning team at Sport Ireland that I worked with, Amy Flanagan, there, he, he did a fantastic job on um, coordinating that. And, uh, and then I looked after some technical stuff. And, um, and if we see the, 
after a few years, she was. She, so I don't know if that's. Are you seeing those videos? Okay. Yeah. So she was. Um, she, she, she ended. She, I mean, she technically became very good. Um, we started off doing standing throws. <clears throat> moved to uh, South African and uh, and uh, I think the thing we were working on, particularly at this stage, was her orbit of the discus. And she got it as, to be honest, she got it as good as anybody that I coached, <laughs> anyway. um, able-bodied or not, you know. Um, so, um, so Neves, um, both both the girls, Neve and Noel, are still. Uh, Competing um, and hopefully going to win loads of medals going forward, you know. So, um, but that's uh, Neve. I, I suppose that was a situation where even though she competes in Paralympic sport, there's not uh, she wouldn't see herself as being disabled, and um, so she, her movement qualities are pretty good. Um, so that is kind of my thoughts on, on you know on the Paralympic end. Um, and I think what I'd like to maybe move on to just is maybe just some uh, sort of personal reflections and maybe lessons that I've learned over the years. <clears throat> and uh, just a few thoughts. I think um, we could talk through these. Uh, you know, the first the first one and. And I, I suppose you, you learn this from Paralympic sport as well, is that, you know, every athlete is different. So don't try and copy and paste uh, your technique ideas or your strength uh, program to every individual. <clears throat> so coach the individual and don't think that, okay, I'm just coaching a discus thrower. You're coaching this individual and this individual is different. And uh, so you need to find out about them, you know, find out their strengths and weaknesses and, uh, and develop a program around that. Um, and second thing, know where you're going or any road you get to there, you know. And uh, I think, you know, athletes in particular, you know, I think successful athletes in particular, uh, they like structure plans and they, they, they want direction from you. Um, I think probably athletes that maybe are not willing to put in the hard work, they might run a little bit from structure, plans, and direction. Um, but but you know, take time at the at the start of each year to sit down with your athletes and you know, looking at their weaknesses, their strengths, and looking at their goals, looking at the gap analysis about you know what gaps you're going to need to close. What are your competitors doing, and uh, build plans like that around your, you know, your proposed competition uh, plan that you have for the year. Um, the third point, I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge thing, and uh, you know, you, you you see probably maybe inexperienced coaches to a certain degree. Uh, you know, they they, they want to know the magic bullet. Uh, what's that magic thing that's going to make me Olympic champion or it's going to make me uh, win the national championship or whatever? And Or what's the secret that uh, that Olympic champion, what's the secret that he's not telling me, you know, about how he become became Olympic champion? And, you know, I think when you dig deeper, you, you find out that it's all based on fundamentals. <laughs> And that those athletes are probably not working on, on that one percent. Those Olympic champions, they're working on the the 90, 70, 80, 90 percent of fundamental things that make every athlete balanced. And uh, <clears throat> you know, every, I think every event has three or four fundamental things that uh, the event boils down to. You know, about what makes a quality thrower and. Um, and generally, it's one of those fundamental things that goes wrong when the uh, when things break down. And uh, so, I think it's uh, focus on fundamentals. And you know, and I think if you're coaching, don't get too technical. You know, always come back to basics and uh, never forget them. 
you know, and just keep addressing basics all the time, you know. Um, the next point I think is answer or ask hard questions of your athletes. Um, you know, if your athlete, if you've got a bit of a kind of a grand hog day going on or a grand hog season, <clears throat> and they're doing the same thing day in day out, well, don't expect any change, and uh, and they need to be, you know, those conversations need to be had, and uh, you know, so you need to do a really solid debrief at the end of the year. You know, if they get to a championship, you need to solidly debrief what happened at the championship, what happened at the lead-in, how prepared were you, um, how prepared were you compared to your opposition, um, uh, what did you see about your opposition that you felt was different from you, um, and uh, get, you know, get a really good assessment going and feed, feed that back to the athlete. But, uh, but I think many, many coaches probably run a little bit away they run away from these hard questions and, and maybe I've, I've done that probably, I think all these things I've probably made mistakes on over the years. I've made every one of these mistakes. Um, but, uh, but I think it's something that I think is really important. And I think the athletes really appreciates it when you take the time to actually dig really deep into their, into their performance and where they, where they're going. Um, I think the next thing is uh, you don't have to be best friends with your athlete, um, but you know you must if 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 they if the athlete feels that there is a sort of not a hundred percent trust between the two of you and you don't quite care about the athlete, they're never really going to back you as a coach, and uh, you know so I think you you must have that trust develop trust. And really care about the athlete. It's uh, and I think if you do that, that's all that matters. You know, you don't have to be hanging out with them and partying with them or whatever. Maybe it's not a bad thing if you can do that too, but uh, but it's not not that important. And sometimes it's better if you're not. I think because then maybe those difficult conversations are a little bit harder to have. You know. Um. The next thing is, was coach athlete pairs don't always work. And um, and this is something I suppose all coaches, you know, they can get a little bit possessive about their athletes, and uh, they're very uh, unwilling to let athletes go. They don't want you. They don't want their athletes being near another coach. You know, <clears throat> you know, and it's it's almost a fear thing. You know, um, but sometimes the relationship between an athlete and a coach, you know, it it uh, it's it just won't work. You know, and there's there's, there is no rebuilding that relationship, and you, you have to just let them go. And um, now, I, th I think a point here I make is that uh, if you're a college coach, you might have that choice. Uh, that's you know, you've, somebody's been signed up for four years, and uh, you have to get through that relationship somehow. And uh, there was, I, I got an interesting lesson. I, I, I had a discussion with. Uh, probably the, uh, one of our top boxing coaches here in Ireland. And uh, I said, look, I've coached this athlete and have real difficulty with the uh, with them. And uh, I think I'm just going to dump them. You know, or I, I just can't work with them any longer. And he said, well, he said, are they, uh, are they any good? He said, well, yeah, they're probably going to win a medal at the next championships, you know, whatever. And, um, and he said, well, he said, you know, I had exactly the same problem. And he said it was a, it was a, a boxer that was going on and he was going to, um, he was a favorite for a medal in the Olympic Games. And he said, I went to the program manager and I said, look, I'm not coaching him anymore. And, uh, and the coach, the program manager said to him, he said, he said, he's a, he's a medal prospect. He said, he is one of our favorites for a medal. He said, you need to find a way of dealing with this. And uh, he says, I don't care what you decide to do, but find something you like about him. I don't care if it's his eyelashes, his eyebrows, <laughs> his smile, his shoelaces. Find it. Find what you like about him and focus on it and get on with it. 
and uh, and I kind of I kind of I took that on board, you know, and uh, and I did go back and and I did try and focus on something insignificant or whatever about the the athlete, and but it it kind of got me through that bump in the road, and uh, and then funny thing, you know, the relationship improved, and uh, but it's kind of interesting, you know, but, but you know, but sometimes that won't work, you know. And you, you can't, you might not be able to deal with that, you know. So, um, uh, the next point I think is continuous learning, and uh, and I think this is something that I've noticed that the, be, the best coaches, you know, if it, you know, being at some conferences and uh, competitions abroad, um, you find all the best coaches kind of they're not, you know, they're, they're sitting around and they're, you know, if they're you're talking to them, they're asking you, hey, what do you do in this situation? You know, how do you get deal with an athlete that's maybe falling in at the back of the circle or whatever and they're constantly asking questions and they never think they've made it you know and they're always trying to learn they're always trying to share ideas i, th- I think it might, it might be something that's unique about throwing coaches uh, i'm not sure if sprints coaches do the same you know there seems to be they, they separate a little bit more but throws coaches are fantastic for uh, coming together and really sharing and uh, and even this I mean this platform is an example of it you know um, what you're doing Rob you know, bringing all the coaches together is just fantastic um, but I think if, if you know if, if you ever think you have made it you're, you're probably finished you know um, so always learn always go to you know try and try and find out new ways of doing things you know it's uh, it's, a, it's a great thing about the sport I think there's always something to learn you know and the, I suppose the last point is, you know, make sure you enjoy it. You know, I think this is all a journey that you're on, you know, whether you're an athlete or a coach. And, uh, and you know, it's only for a certain amount of time. It's you know, someday it's going to be over and you're going to be looking back on it and you're kind of going to be thinking, God, you know, all those places I went to and all those people I was mixed with and, you know, met and, uh, God, I didn't really enjoy that enough you know I, I took it you know i'm not i'm not saying you have to go crazy um but uh but you know make sure you have fun along the way and <clears throat> um i was going to give you one example we we had a um i think uh irish probably athletes have never been accused of uh backing off on the fun side um but uh, we had one new year's eve competition uh, that we used to run I think this is over 20 years ago, so the statute of limitations are probably finished, you know. Um, um, so we, we, we had the shot put competition on the, on the strike of midnight. And uh, we used to all line up. And the, the goal of the competition was that whoever won the competition would be furthest in the world. So we come up number one in the world rankings immediately. And, um, but there was a kind of a slight condition of entry uh, that uh, we weren't allowed. One of our uh, one of our athletes was a guard, a policeman, you know. So he brought along a breathalyzer, <laughs> and you had to be over the limit to uh, to join the competition. Uh, so uh, I think um, nobody did PRs on the on the day, but uh, but you still ended up being uh, number one in the world <laughs> and having a good night. <laughs> So I don't, I don't think I can recommend that in my current position. Uh, so it's only about somebody I knew. I was never there. You know. um, so uh, yeah, so have some fun. We make sure you do that. Um, that's um, that's kind of where uh, I was going to finish up there. Now I have one uh, little tool that I use in. Um, in managing athletes, and I thought it'd be, it might be interesting to share that. Um, so I might have to go back out. Anyway. And I might go back out and uh, pull this thing in. So just a second. Uh, so here. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so I. This is a. Heptathletes that's 
I did some work with and uh, I, I, I spoke to Lizzie earlier and she uh, asked, did you mind if I share uh, uh, this document? And um, so she, she is delighted that she, she agreed anyway. But it's just an example. It's, it's something we use uh, for our, when we put a support team around an athlete. Uh, so like Lizzie's a heptathlete and she's currently injured. Uh, we're just carrying a little bit of an injury, and uh, but her training is a little bit restricted, it's, so it's something she's working really well through. Um, but you can see there's a, if I go through the categories here, so uh, you've you've uh, physiology, sports psychology, life skills, nutrition, S and C, physiotherapy, medical support, and then. Uh, blue one here is uh, your competition plan and results and technical technical aspects and and then we go in through each event and uh, so for all this physiology sports uh, life skills nutrition you know, there's a different person in charge of each of these so we so we bring these guys into a team meeting and then we go around the wheel basically and uh, and you can see in at the moment physio is a big issue but as her injury is clearing up that we can reduce that factor size down, and uh, and if I click on physio, you know we can see we can go over there's maybe some issues she was dealing with in the physio, um, or if I click on chocolate up here, you can see uh, you know there there's some you can we can note in some technical points, so it's a great uh, kind of communication tool, and when we get a we get all the group together in um, to discuss her Lizzie's performance and up to update and plan for the future, this is a really good tool that we found uh, to be to be um, make sure you're not leaving anything out of the conversation and, uh, and that you're covering all bases. Uh, so it's it's a thing called Goldscape, and uh, I think it's pretty cheap to uh, look into, um, but uh, certainly something that I'd recommend. Uh, and, uh, and then you can you can store documents into it, uh, like all your competition results, and you can put in your competition plan and <coughs> periodization plans and all this sort of stuff. And put all your uh, training plans. Uh, you can attach in documents into it, you know. So it's um, so. Um, but uh, that's uh, that's where I'm gonna. That's very it. cool. <laughs> um, so has. Um, did you really uh, I'll put it back to you Brandon there I suppose yeah. We've got some, hey, Coach got some I'll, I'll let uh, Brandon ask the important questions but we got somebody hogging up our chat line here Nick yep. Sweeney uh, <laughs> he, he wants to know Nick, Nick, one he's Nick. upset one he's upset you didn't give him a shout out for winning the uh, New Year's competition oh, two yeah. <laughs> Two, he uh, he wants to know about the time you were uh, mistaken for Tom Hanks and they in in a in, in a pub in Ireland, and, uh, <laughs> and and three, he wants to know about the fur uh, the fur blog trophy or fur bog trophy. <laughs> oh, the fur blog trophy. Okay. And I'll if anybody's me, um... on and doesn't know who Nick Sweeney is, he's a what three time Olympian went to went to Harvard. Great discus thrower, yeah. discus discus record holder in uh, Ireland. Yeah. Great guy. So I'll tell the the furball trophy first of all. Uh, I'll go in reverse order. Uh, the furball trophy that's a golf trophy that Nick uh, and his brother Mark and myself play for every time he's back in Ireland. And uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Nick, because I think I'm the current holder of the trophy. Um, so it's. Uh, <laughs> If you want to talk more about that, I'll keep talking. <laughs> um, what was the other one? It was uh, Tom Hanks. Oh when man, you got the... that's so funny. <laughs> this is this is uh, we 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 had a competition in a rural uh, in in northwest Donegal, and uh, there was a, a kind of a country sports day. And we threw the weight and threw the shot or something, and uh, and then we uh, we went down and uh, we took some uh, 
it's a couple of cold beers outside of outside a pub, and um, and we noticed these guys uh, coming up, staring at me and taking my photograph. All right. And I said, well, what the hell's going on here? And uh, so anyway, uh, we, we discovered anyway that apparently uh, somebody thought I looked like Tom Hanks or something at the time. So I think Tom Hanks must have been going through some rehab or something uh, or something desperate had happened and they thought he looked like me. But um, um, And they thought Nick and his brother were my, were my bodyguards. And uh, so we decided... Oh, what the hell? Should we play along with this story? <laughs> and so I think we went into the bar. At the bar, we were getting three drinks, uh, T-shirts. I told them, can't wait to wear this T-shirt in Hollywood. And uh, so <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, but Sweeney was to blame for it, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, we, we've got another question from Nick. Um, he's asking, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, how, how have your coaching techniques changed or have they changed much from your days in Sweden in 1994 pre-Euro champs? Yeah, well, that was, that was, that was an incredible experience for me being there with, uh, with Nick and Fiesta and Hustle Einstein, actually. Uh, they were training partners at the time, and I went up and probably Nick. Nick says I messed up his uh, his uh, European Championship uh, chances from going to Sweden <laughs> for a couple of weeks with him. Uh, but I don't know. I did a PB up there, so uh, so it didn't harm me anyway. So if he was a bit of a wimp, he, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, no, that, that was uh, that was that was an incredible experience for me being involved in that environment. So I see with the Aston and Peter Goodmans and uh, so it's a great crew of Icelandic stars and Siggy Einarsson and Nick and his brother Mark came up and came and came there too. It was uh, it's a fantastic, uh, it was really eye opening for me. And it's the first time that I spent some time with the Aston and we've remained friends for a long time. He's a, a great guy, fantastic guy. Uh, Levi's got, Levi Miller is asking a question of what do you do to maintain communication with Team Ireland, Ireland athletes while they're in the U.S. competing in the NCAA? Yeah, it's um, what we what we tend to do is um, like in within within Athletics Ireland we have uh, we'd have somebody in charge of sprints and somebody in charge of endurance. And, I'm looking at it's a field event, and uh, so it's really just regular emails and uh, trying to keep in touch with them, uh, asking them to update us with uh, how they're getting on in training and competition, and uh, if there's any way we can help them. Um, you know, I, I, I think most of their uh, the setups that they would have in college are pretty good, and. Uh, the, uh, obviously, with NC2A rules, it's it's difficult for us to intervene or to assist in, in any way. Um, so it's really, I think, the best thing we can do is just try and support them uh, and uh, encourage them and uh, give them as much information about what's happening back home and what you know, uh, can, you know, uh, qualifying, uh, what they're going to need to do to qualify for meets back here and stuff like that you know so but it's uh yeah that, that's i'm not sure if that answers this question oh, that's, that's great and uh, kind of a related question from from gary aldrich who, who sent us some earlier is you know how do you how do you find athletes transition back you know after the post-collegiate system and, and then working into athletics ireland and are there some some protocols you guys employ there, or do you find it to be a, a smooth transition? Yeah, I don't. I don't think it is smooth. <clears throat> it's. Um, I think it's difficult um, for the athlete, um, you know, because they've come from an environment where pretty much everything is done for them, <laughs> and everything is on their doorstep. Uh, you know, from their gym, their physio, you know, everything tends to be on site. And, and then when they come back here, it's uh, it's 
probably never really like that, you know, un- unless you live beside uh, our National Sports Institute, um, where you can get attention to all these services. But that's that's only in Dublin. So if you're going back into a rural environment, it's uh, it's a difficult transition. And uh, I think the best thing that we can do is try and build a team around these athletes when they come back and, uh, and try and... Um, we, we can uh, farm out kind of some of the some of the uh, support services to people ex- expertise around the country and get them to feed into that. But it's uh, it's not easy, um, and I think it's uh, you know I, th- I think we have been well supported by Sport Ireland in this in this path. Uh, they've 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 got a lot more. Uh, understanding of our sport um, but they're also dealing with boxing and sailing and uh, and a lot of other sports so but but I've, I've noticed you know every year now their expertise is getting better and better and uh, they appreciate that <clears throat> track and field is just such a wide encompassing sport and it's, it's very easy for them to deliver services into something like boxing or uh, rowing or something you know where you can get all the team together in one go, and they all train together. And uh, whereas we're we're all spread out, and, and our events are so different, you know. So it's uh, it, uh, it's it's diff- difficult, you know. I think, but it's probably no more difficult than an athlete leaving college and going back to their home environment in the states as well. You know, I think uh, I think the problem is not unique to us. You know, so very clear. And you talked earlier about like talent identification days and kind of finding people, whether it's able-bodied or Paralympic athletes, and kind of suiting them into events. And what are the biggest thing you're looking, biggest things you're looking for, and like how do you identify talent within Athletics Ireland, and and uh, what are some of the biggest things you're looking for in people that maybe haven't been exposed to throwing yet? Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> that's something that. We're, we're really looking at developing at the moment. I think it's something that we haven't probably been, uh, I, th- I, th- I think it's something we probably haven't been great at. I think the talent ID has happened at the local level, uh, the, where the, the local clubs are uh, picking up talents. And, uh, but as a national organization, we haven't really led that kind of path so far. Um, but we are working on something pretty, uh, uh, pretty good at the moment, which I think can bring in a lot of talent. Um, the, uh, the school system here is, um, you know, we, we would always have done physical education in school, but but in the last year or two now, they've introduced uh, physical education as an exam subject, hmm. and uh, so part of the curriculum of our physical education program then is there are seven subjects within that PE uh, curriculum and athletics is going to be, or track and field is going to be one of those seven subjects. So this is going to be, I think it's going to be a game changer for us in terms of attracting people. We're going to, they're going to be able to try out the sport in school across the board, you know, every single student that does PE and, uh, but also it's going to build coaches because you, uh, there's kind of a junior cycle and then there's going to be a senior cycle of uh, exam. And in the senior cycle, you can come at this from the angle of a coach rather than a performer as, as an athlete. So, so it could be a double win for us, you know, and I, I think this is going to be a great opportunity for us that we've never had before, you know. So. Really cool. I feel like phys- physical education in the states might be slipping a little bit the other direction. <laughs> is it really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it's awesome. yeah. Th- this this is a kind of conversation that we're having. It's we're at the early stages of it at the moment, and we're trying to develop this. Um, uh, but I think it's it has the potential to be huge. It's something we we, uh, we need to jump on. Yeah. On it. To Brandon's yeah. point, at, at one time. All 50 states mandated physical education as part of the high school curriculum, which, uh, and now certain, a lot of school districts mandate it, but 
not one state mandates it. No. So a school system and wherever cannot require, and, and this is grades, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, high school years. The school yeah. system uh, doesn't have to have that other requirement at all. Wow. And that was only, this was only going back maybe 25 years ago. 25 years ago, all 50 states required physical education as part of their curriculum. Yeah, it seems, I mean, it's such a no brainer, yeah. you know, for just for good health and, you know, the improvement of society, really, that's to, to get people fit and more knowledgeable about what they're doing. Um, and the, the, the school leaving program, uh, leaving our, our, when you finish high school here in Ireland, that's when you do what's called the leaving certificate. And uh, so this year was the first year that they had run the exams through the leaving certificate. I think there were 1,200 pupils. Just There was a pilot study done on 50 schools, 1,200 did it this year. But they expect that number possibly to grow to like 15,000 plus over the next number of years, every year. So, um, so that's possibly 15,000 people more that will be exposed. And that's right, that's just at the senior level. At the junior level, it'll be much higher numbers. Um, so it's, I think, the people who are going to be exposed to athletics. And then our challenge uh, for Athletics Ireland is to make sure that all those PE teachers are competent coaches. You know? So we've, we've got to deliver a, a coach education program that's going to feed into this and teach those fundamentals that I was going to talk about. So it's... Uh, it's a big, a big challenge for us, but, uh, but I think it's hugely exciting. You know? Very cool. And what, what does the coaching education look like in Ireland? I know like we have USA Track and Field does some education, and, and our, like our, our National Coaches Association does, does some stuff. But do you have similar kind of national organizations that kind of help do that yeah. education? Yeah, we the, the the national we have a national body here that uh, kind of authorizes our coach education program, and that's called Coaching Ireland. And that would be funded by the government. Uh, it would come under the umbrella of Sport Ireland. And uh, <clears throat> traditionally, um, traditionally we would have followed the IAAF programs, so they're you know level one, two, three, four, five, whatever. And um, but Coaching Ireland have to kind of put their stamp of approval on those IWF programs. And uh, in recent years, they've been slower and slower to stamp the approval on it. Mm. And, uh, and what the, the feedback we were getting really was that uh, the IWF system as it stood was not practical enough. And it really resulted in uh, coaches just going along, collecting a uh, certificate. You know, I'm a level one coach. Now I want to do my level two exam. And then they straight on to their level three. But there was no real evidence. Can this person actually coach? You know, they were, they were accumulating knowledge, but no experience. And, uh, and I think uh, from Coaching Ireland's, uh, we, like we've, we found this frustrating to go through this change but but in retrospect they're they're absolutely right and uh, and i think the same happens in uh, some uh, you know like the number of say strength and conditioning coaches that are churned out of colleges you know they might know everything about strength and conditioning but can they actually coach and that's the main part of their job um so it's a huge uh, huge question um so we've 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 had to develop programs. Then you know I, th I think we we set up a system now where if uh, coaches are coming out in the higher level programs, they must apply by interview and uh, fill out an application and that, that that they give a resume of their coaching current coaching career, uh, who they've coached, where they see themselves going, what they want to achieve, and and uh, and we're. We're kind of building it. Uh, it's every, everything is much more practical. That you know, there's much more uh, assessment on how they actually deliver, how they actually, uh, and they, they must also be able to assess other coaches. And uh, so it's uh, 
it's it's becoming a bit more holistic, I suppose, or whatever the word is. You know? yeah. Very cool. I know it's getting almost close to eleven thirty your time, so we don't want to hold oh, you too much longer. Sorry. But um, <laughs> we got one more good question here that I think might be a good one to end on if I can find it. Um, Levi Miller, it's another question from Levi Miller, and he's asking, "Do you have any great stories you'd like to share about a Paralympic athlete you've coached and that was inspirational to you, or, or at least very memorable?" Um, <clears throat> I think I, th- I think uh, almost all the athletes you coach, there's there's something uh, particularly inspiring, you know. Um, I think I think one of the yeah, it, it, I, th- I think it'd be unfair to maybe single out a, a, a single athlete, but uh, you know, I. I I, 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 I just I'm trying to I'm trying to think of a story here. Oh, I, I know I just put you on the spot too. It's fine if if, if you. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't like to single out one particular athlete. You know, like <clears throat> I think I think they've all <clears throat> they've all they've all had huge challenges um, in getting where they got to, and uh, I think as a team, really, um, they make you extremely proud and. Um, and I think it's it's great, you know, when they, they all have their own individual challenges, but when they come together and you see them supporting each other in a, in a championship, it's, uh, I think it makes you proud not just to be coaching them, but, you know, to be proud to be Irish and see the way they uh, deliver themselves on the international stage, you know. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't like to maybe just focus on one person, you know. So. Totally. Awesome. Well, um Thank you very much. This has been awesome. I know I've got a bunch of notes. I, I love the the kind of the the list of things that you've shared and, and kind of the lessons you've learned along the way. Um, really appreciate you sharing those experiences and and some of the pieces of athletics Ireland. And, and uh, it's always cool to see how other people do it. Um, really appreciate you taking out the time. And um, hopefully we didn't keep you up too too late. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, listen, it's. it's- it's been fantastic for me. Um, I really appreciate uh, Rob and MF Athletic uh, uh, bringing this whole thing together, and uh, it's uh, it's fantastic to share some ideas. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, so. hey, you, you still got half an hour to prepare for the midnight comp. <laughs> <laughs> Enough time for a warm up. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to <laughs> drop it to five kilos, Rob. <laughs> So I'm still on the six kilo at the moment. We've got a few years. You know, a years. Hey, uh, last Dave, thanks thanks for everything. But uh, I, you know, for, there's some younger people on on here, obviously. And uh, what is there still a difference between Northern Ireland and Ireland when it comes to some of the athletics involved? Um, or is that a loaded I'm, question? I'm, I'm, I'm glad you uh, just brought a major political question from my last one. You have 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> no, uh, no, no, Northern Ireland are... Um, uh, Northern Ireland, obviously, it's one of the... I think a lot of uh, people aren't quite clear. It's one of, one of the four countries that make up the United Kingdom. Uh, so they, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and they all have their own athletic federations. Um, so Northern Ireland have Athletics Northern Ireland, which administers the sports there. Um, but athletes that are in Northern Ireland, um, they, d- due to kind of agreements between, I suppose, the Irish and British government, um, athletes there can compete. They can choose to compete for Ireland or Great Britain. And uh, so it's it's up to the athletes who they uh, who they want to represent. Um, now I think we probably benefit in the majority of cases in that situation. Maybe maybe because it's easier to get on an Irish team than it would be onto a British team. Um, but uh, but they do have really good support system up there in Northern Ireland, and they've some great people and. Uh, Running, uh, working in the sport there, and, uh, and we, we we collaborate 
quite uh, quite closely with them in around managing athletes, and uh, so it's 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 quite a quite a good relationship. So, so very cool. Don't know if that's, uh, did that get me out of it? <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot! Um, is it one last? thing uh, of, of housekeeping uh, you know thanks to mf and, and rob did you have a um, a raffle winner for this yeah uh, uh doug doug petrick who uh yes. doug if you're listening I'll, I'll i'll dm you the the information we'll get you a 50 dollars certificate over to you we had uh we had well now it's up to we had 155 entries wow. for uh, that certificate this week so Thanks, awesome. thanks to thanks to Coach Sweeney for coming on. It was, this was fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much, you know, Coach, and, and we really appreciate you coming out. And thanks to MF, the National Throws Coach Association. Um, I, I've really been enjoying these, and and you know, when we get great guests like you, David, on, it just makes it all all the better. And, and thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure having you on today. Um, like, Cheers, guys. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, all the best. Cheers. Yeah. Awesome. Thank Stop you. swinging again, Dave. <laughs> Straight out of the rains tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> June, June 9th. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs>